All right. So welcome, everyone. Um, my name is Heikki Lindagangas. I've been working on Postgres for a long time for different companies, uh, Committer, Hacker. Uh, I'm also a co-founder of Neon. Uh, we started about three years ago uh, to work on uh, like a startup company to do Postgres stuff and uh, mostly to work on serverless Postgres uh, and uh, be a cloud provider uh, for anyone who wants to run a Postgres database, basically. So Neon is a Postgres cloud provider. Uh, if you go to neon.tech, click a few buttons, you'll get a Postgres database. Very easy to get started with. We also call Neon our storage system that we use um, on our offering. So the, the storage system we have is tailored for specifically for Postgres, uh, but it has a lot of nice properties that allow us to do things like time travel, uh, branching, uh, and, and some other nice things. Uh, it also kind of is the key technology behind our serverless offering, so it allows us to start up Postgres in under one second because the storage system takes care of the while recovery and, and all of that stuff uh, that you normally uh, take some time when you're starting Postgres. Uh, but for time travel, it's kind of an introduction. This is what your traditional Postgres uh, or you know, really any other database works the same. Uh, typically it looks like uh, you would have Postgres and you would have, it would run on some kind of a machine or a virtual machine probably these days. Uh, and you would have a local, local hard drive or local SSDs that you run on. Or maybe you have a SAN or maybe you use EBS volumes or something. But the point is that Postgres manages its own storage. It has, it has the, you know, it assumes that it has a local file system and it can do stuff on that. And then you have some kind of a backup solution, it's PG backrest uh, or something, uh, while EEG, whatever, to take backups, probably daily backups, weekly backups, whatnot, and you upload them to cloud storage uh, and you do a while archiving to make sure that you can do uh, recovery to any point in time within the day. This is the kind of typical setup. I mean, there's a lot of variants. Maybe you also have high availability, so you also have a replica running that is kind of streaming the wall there as well, and so forth. Uh, but this is kind of the basic, basic setup that the Postgres you know, setup looks like these days. Now, with Neon, uh, the Neon storage system kind of replaces um, many of these parts. Like, it replaces the local SSDs first, first of all. Uh, on Neon, Postgres doesn't have a local disk. Well, well, it does for like temporary files and uh, sorting, that kind of stuff. But all of the real data lives uh, on the Neon storage system. Uh, it also replaces the backups and the while archive. Uh, it uses cloud storage behind the scenes, but it, it kind of replaces all that. So the only thing, the, what Postgres sees is just the storage system and it connects to that. And whenever Postgres needs to read data, instead of reading it from local disk, it reads it from the, from the network uh, storage system. All of this is based on the Postgres, uh, like the right ahead logging, and all of this, this you know, traditional backup while archive, all of this same infrastructure, but, uh, but, it, but it's a little smarter. But instead of getting full backups, it operates at the page level, so it can uh, like reconstruct pages, uh, at, well, like one page at a time instead of restoring a whole backup. And so one nice thing about this is that it keeps all of the history just like a while archive, but differently from a traditional while archive and point in time recovery, it actually makes the whole history accessible or re recoverable page at the time. So you can reconstruct any version of any page uh, at any point in time very quickly. So this is all like what we call separation of compute and storage. So we have the storage system and then you have compute, which is Postgres. And, uh, and I kind of talked about this stuff already, but like having a separate storage system allows you allows us to shut down Postgres completely, and then it allows us to start it up very quickly because the storage system is already, uh, has the data uh, hot enough that you can, you can spin, just spin up a new uh, Postgres instance and connect to the storage. What you can also do, you can share the same storage by multiple read-only nodes. Like traditionally, if you wanna have read, -on read replicas, you actually have to duplicate all of the data. Uh, well, storage is pretty cheap nowadays, but it, it does mean that when you need to spin up a new read replica, you have to restore a backup and that can take a while. Maybe you have some kind of a snapshot in mechanism, but then it gets more complicated. Uh, what it also actually means, and this is important for, for some high availability cases, is that there's like a single source of truth of what is the latest 
transactions that have committed. Like traditionally you need to do, if you have replicas and you do promotions and failovers, then if you actually do those failovers, it can kind of get ambiguous of which one has the latest data. You might accidentally promote two of them at the same time, or you might promote a standby that didn't have all of the data uh, from, from the primary yet. So the, the Neon storage system kind of uh, takes care of that for you as well. Like it, it always has a constant view of like what is the tail, what is the last transactions that have committed. And, and you can also scale that independently. Like if you have the provisional local disk, you have to choose a size for the disk. So it's, I like to call it, it's like a, having a SAN on steroids because it knows about the Postgres uh, format. So the way this looks like is that Postgres streams the write ahead log to the storage system. Uh, there's this thing called safekeepers. Uh, and the reads go to another node in the storage system called the page servers. And we've kind of separated those duties uh, uh, for reasons. Uh, one interesting fact about this, this architecture is that the write call, like whenever Postgres needs to evict the page from the buffer pool, normally it gets written back to disk. But on Neon, that's a no-op. Like whenever Postgres needs to evict the page from the buffer pool, it, it just gets thrown away uh, because the storage system can always reconstruct it uh, from the wall. So kind of on the wall path, uh, we have the safekeeper nodes, which are responsible for like maintaining the durability of recent transactions. So whenever you commit a transaction, uh, it gets replicated or streamed, the right ahead log gets streamed to the safekeeper nodes, and this is like, we use the same mechanism as Postgres for synchronous replication, uh, and, the, and we have a consensus algorithm based on Paxos going on there, so you make sure that uh, you don't lose recent transactions, but also if you know, something crashes or something, you always know like what are the recent transactions, so there's no ambiguity like which standby is ahead of which one, uh, the, the consensus algorithm takes care of that. Uh, the other part is the page servers, and that's where we have most of the code uh, in the storage system. Uh, it digests the incoming wall stream and kind of reshuffles the wall uh, so that instead of being a sequential wall, it can very quickly find all of the records for a single block. And, and that's important when you then need to read that page because you can find all the records for the single page and uh, replay those records instead of having to you know, replay all of the logs. Question, yes. So the little arrows for Postgres to the page servers seem to imply you're writing to the page servers. That's right. The, that's like a request response path. So the, the, the Postgres is making requests to the page server and the page server response. So yeah, it's not the data flow. Um, data is flowing upwards from page server to compute. Um, we do use local SSDs still in Postgres for caching, but that's like just for caching purposes. If it crashes, we throw it away. Uh, because it turns out local SSDs are very fast. So like, uh, you do want to use that when, when you have that. So from a durability point of view, the safekeepers and the cloud storage together make sure that we don't lose data. Like the safekeepers hold the most, most recent while that hasn't been processed yet uh, to make sure that we don't lose that. Uh, but then after we have processed the while, in the, you know, reshuffled the while, we upload it to cloud storage, or Amazon S3, or on Azure, their, their blob storage. And the page servers we have, which is the most complicated piece of all of this, is nice because it doesn't, like the durability doesn't depend on that part. If one of the page servers we run dies, uh, we can just launch a new one and it will automatically download the stuff from cloud storage that was need, uh, missing. And on the read path, whenever Postgres needs to read a page, it sends a a request to the page server, get page number 100, get page number 200, so forth, and the page server will, re will return that page. And that's where the time travel magic happens because the page server can reconstruct the page at any point in time. So whenever we launch a Postgres node, it knows like what is the point in time you are at. It's a log sequence number, LSN. And all of these requests to the page server, it's actually like block number and the LSN number, like what is the point in time you want to read it at, and the page server will, will do the magic to, to reconstruct that version of the page and send it back to Postgres. So the Postgres, it just looks like it's there, uh, but the, the storage system is doing all the reconstruction stuff. Um, so, yeah, I mentioned like in 
in, po in Neon, when you start up Postgres, it never needs to do while replay. Pager will take care of that, so that makes the startup very fast. Um, so a little bit more detail on, on how this works. So in a traditional system, if you think about it, you will always have these daily backups, and then you keep the while. Um, and if you need to do point-in-time recovery, uh, you start from the previous backup you had, uh, like last night, probably, hopefully. You don't need to restore too far, far back. Uh, and then you will start Postgres, and it will do the archive recovery, uh, replaying all of the logs, like hours and hours of logs that have accumulated during the day to, re to replay uh, back to that point in time that you were looking for. And then you will connect to Postgres and go, oh, this was the wrong point in time. And then you will do it all over again and wait for another hour for, for the re recovery to finish. And this is very frustrating if you are, because the reason you're, you're doing this is because you screwed up. Like you're doing this at 3 a.m. in the morning when you accidentally dropped a table and you would prefer not to do like multi-hour experiments uh, when you're tired uh, to figure this out. So that's really the, the use case for time travel. Like uh, it makes the point in time recovery much nicer and that's what you want at 3 a.m. in the morning. So Neon uh, kind of works the same, like it's the same concept. You take the last backup and you replay the logs, but we do it at the page level granularity. So instead of taking a backup of the full, whole backup, oh, the whole system, which could be a terabyte of data, uh, you start up Postgres immediately, but then whenever you're reading stuff, like when you're running queries, you do the, the recovery on demand, like on the fly, whenever a Postgres needs to read a page, you fetch the last backup of just that page and you replay the records of just that single page. And this might sound expensive, uh, but it's not. Like, it's not actually that expensive. Uh, like, you need to have that data available, but uh, it turns out when you reshuffle the data and do a little bit of work while you're archiving the data, uh, like, you can have, we structure the the storage like an LSM tree, like, like structured merge tree, so you can pretty quickly find, you can pretty quickly, quickly find the last backup of an individual block and all of the while records that go with it. So this doesn't add, it doesn't add as much overhead as you might think, that's what I'm saying basically. Uh, and those additional tricks you can do, like you can think about traditional backup systems, you would have incremental backups uh, and all kinds of stuff to speed it up. All of those same concepts kind of apply here, but the, uh, the storage system is doing that at the page level granularity. So if there's a lot of changes to a single page, then we can create extra images of that, just that page that is like churning a lot, so you don't need to replay a million records when, it get, when, it, when it's requested, but only like 10 or 100 or something. Um, just to kind of illustrate this, like if you look at the original WAL file, you would have inserts, updates, deletes, deletes uh, on different pages kind of intermixed uh, in the order that they were uh, written. But in the, these files that we store in Neon Storage System, we have reordered them so you can, you have all of the inserts of the deletes for the single page together uh, and then you can find them all quickly uh, as like one read. And, and there's like a little mini index and, and stuff to find, find the right files. So the way we think about storage is that it's kind of a 2D uh, system where the block number or relation and block number is like one dimension, but then there's the time dimension. And everything we do is kind of dealing with this two-dimensional uh, storage system. Um, so when you need to find a page version, the way it works is that you kind of look up all of the files that, are, that have modified that block and you go like drill down in, in the LSN space, like the time dimension, and find, until you find the last image. And then you walk up, back up uh, through all of the while records and you replay them. Whenever a new while comes into the system, like new, new, de new transactions, uh, we create one of these reshuffled uh, delta files, we call them, and put them at the top. Uh, when we have accumulated enough of them, uh, then we do what's called compaction in log structured merge trees. Uh, so we kind of merge together these, these files and reshuffle them again to create another set of files, but uh, like partitioned differently. So that when you're looking for a single page, you can, you can find, you don't need to go through so many files basically. 
And finally, we have a garbage collection system. So when you know there's a, a horizon of how how long you want to keep your data, a week or a month, uh, whatever. Uh, whenever there are files that are not needed anymore, uh, then we we can garbage collect them away. That's basically how it works. Now I want to actually show you in practice what does it look like in the user interface, like and in the service. It's going to be exciting. Live demos always are. Uh, so I created a little application. There's a button. You can click on it. And the counter increments. So this is backed by a Postgres database uh, running on Neon. You might have seen that the first time I clicked on it, there was a small delay, like one second. That's because Neon is serverless, so it, Postgres was not actually running. So the first time I clicked on it, it took uh, like a second to launch it. Uh, but now it's fast. Uh, and if you go to the Neon console uh, and uh, to the SQL editor, you can, you know, this is the database. You can see that you have the same value here, 152, I think that matches. Yeah, there you go. So this is the database that, that this counter is connected to. Um, the time travel functionality is, is part of the restore uh, thing here. Uh, if you go to the restore tab, you click main, there's only one branch on, on this project, and you can specify the point in time as a timestamp. For example, let's do, or uh, I can't do math, can I? Uh, if I wanna see what does it look like at 10 a.m., no, I don't wanna restore, I wanna, it's down here, query at timestamp. And it will tell you that at that time, the counter was 135. So what this does behind the scenes, it actually, when you click that button, query a timestamp, it launches a new Postgres instance. It spins up a new serverless Postgres instance. Uh, it connects to the storage system, but we know that we, it's gonna request all of the pages at that older, older time, point, point in time, like the older LSN, and then it runs the query, and then it kills Postgres again. Uh, this also shows like the serverless functionality, so it takes like that roughly one second every time you click that, because it will uh, spin up a new Postgres instance and run that, but you can, you can basically uh, run it at any point in time. So this is very helpful, like if you then, you know, this is the, the way you figure out like what is the point in time that you need to restore to, and then when you're happy, you can click proceed and create a new branch at that point in time and actually like make it permanent. But at 3 a.m. in the morning, when you, you know, actually dro accidentally dropped the table, you can kind of binary search with this, like what was the time that you actually need to restore, or if you're curious what happened to the database, uh, like you can run queries on the catalogs here to see like what tables exist and so forth to kind of figure out what happened. So, questions on this part? On the demo? Yeah, go ahead. So for example, if you have only one table that you dropped, maybe it's a, is it a possible to only do that restore, so not create an entire instance, but restore only one object at the, the same database with a different name maybe? Uh, like for when you actually restore it. Uh, no, we don't do that. Uh, like it's a whole, I mean, when you do restore, it restores the whole database. It, that, would get, uh, that would be very nice. It gets complicated when you think about it because there might be foreign key references and all, you know, all kinds of dependencies between stuff. So that would be very hard to do in Postgres in general. Uh, so in that case, I would recommend that you restore, like you create a branch of that so you can kind of have both running at the same time and then you can do a copy or something to, uh, you know, copy over the part you needed uh, from the other da database. That's how I would recommend to do that. Correct, <laughs> yeah, yeah, we get that question a lot. We have branching, but how do you merge? Uh, <laughs> yeah, merging would be hard. So do you need to do, uh, you know, copy or a logical replication or something logical uh, to do that? Uh, so question about uh, pages. So if I, assume, if I understand correctly, you have just one page at the bottom of your graph and then you, you build all the changes or do you have some, I don't know, once every hour fresh page image? Because I assume if I have something that's really changed often, so for example, you have click counter and then you have schema version table. Mm -hmm. So schema version table will, will be really, uh, 
not not change often, but counter will be changed every few seconds. So restoring uh, click counter will take longer if you don't keep cache uh, or something similar. Right. So I mean, what the storage system will do if you have a, a tape or a page that gets modified a lot, it will create intermediate like images or new backups of, of just that part of the database. Uh, so it, it doesn't really materially uh, like affect how long it actually takes. Like you will find the image quicker if you do a lot of action. I mean, Postgres naturally kind of creates full page images in many cases anyway. So uh, yeah, it doesn't have, it, how many updates there have been doesn't affect uh, how long, uh, doesn't materially affect how long it takes. Uh, when do you decide uh, if you wanted to write a full page versus like a, a history of the log records? Uh, it's not very smart at the moment. Like we, we, we're planning on different heuristics. Uh, but what we currently do, we actually create like images of larger ranges of pages, like a gigabyte ranges at a time when there has been just, I don't remember what exactly the current rule is, maybe two or three times. Maybe the amount of, when the amount of while is two or three times the amount of images, I think that's when we created. But yeah, there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot more smarts you could do there, but we haven't done it that it has been sufficient so far. Like you could imagine having a rule that whenever there has been a thousand updates on a page, then you would create an image or, or something like that. Um, so that's the demo. I don't have a lot more material because I was really excited to just show this demo. I think this is really cool. Um, I just have one more thing I want to mention. Uh, like Neon also does branching. And I, you know, if you go to the restore tab, what you will actually do is to create a branch uh, of your database. Uh, the branching is a, like, this is a killer feature of Neon. Like a lot of people use Neon specifically for branching, but it's interesting that this actually came out as, as a little bit of an afterthought of the architecture. Like we were designing or thinking about how do we do this whole thing and we, uh, like we did the time travel thing for backup and restore purposes as, uh, in the beginning. Like it's very useful to have these snapshots and be able to do that. But then we very quickly realized that, you know, if once you have this whole storage system that is, you know, keeps all the history and makes it available, you can very easily do copy and write branches. So if you want to create a new branch of your database, it's just like a thin overlay. You only need to keep the delta basically uh, between the, the the original branch and, and the new branch. So a lot of our customers use this for like development environments. Uh, you know, you can create the branch of your production database uh, just very quickly, like under a second and run, run some tests on it and you can drop it again. Uh, or people run it in their CI CD pipelines. Like every time you create a pull request, you also fork the database or create a branch of the database and run a preview on that or something. And then you can just drop it later if you don't don't want that. Uh, so that's, that's actually a very much a uh, used feature in Postgres. But it's interesting that it came out of as an afterthought, like immediately after we thought how to do the time travel or for point in time recovery purposes, it kind of became obvious that we should do this one as well. Um, that's really all the material I have. So I won't keep you any longer than necessary, but I'm happy to take, you know, the next half an hour for questions if there's any more. Uh, the, I think it was it was partially asked already, but um, what happens with really occasionally you have applications which have really hot pages. It's not a great, but certain pages which get updated, let's say a hundred times a second. I mean, it's not great application design. It should be refactored out. Mm -hmm. But your application is doing this. You've moved it to Neon Storage. Are you likely to hit some edge cases like that to watch out for? Because you know, I'm, it's new for me. This storage engine built on sort of. Yeah, I, that should work. Like, as I said, like it doesn't. That's fine for us. Like that's kind of that's actually kind of the easy case. Like if you, it just means that there's a lot of wild records for a single page, and we'll you know we'll create those images every now and then. So it, yeah, that that works. There's no particular problem with that. Um, cool. I don't know if, does that answer the question? I don't know, but you should you know give it a shot and see how it works. But yeah, that works. I like. If you're keeping all of the history for something that's updated very frequently, like you're keeping a lot of logs uh, for those updates, but that's no different from Postgres anyway. Like if you are doing that, you're accumulating a lot of while in your while archive. Um, so this is actually, 
this is nicer in many ways. Like if you're doing that in your traditional Postgres backups, daily backups and wall archive, and then if you do need to restore, you will have to restore all of that. But we, in, in that scenario, I think we would like take backups of those pages much, much more frequently than you would normally do. So it, I think it probably works better. So I have a question about branches. Uh, how do you manage all those branches? Because as I assume if you have many CI CDs, uh, then some dev environments, then some test environments, then backups and so on. So I, I have mental model which is similar to Git a bit. Okay, there is no merging here, but still how do you keep up with all those Right, states? so I think there's two, two ways to answer that question. How do we manage the branches for you? Uh, like we have the control plane and uh, there's a database internally that you know keeps track of those branches and in the storage system, you know, there's you know APIs to to do all that. But as a user, how do you keep track of your branches? Uh, that's a good question. We do have APIs for creating branches, listing branches, del deleting branches. So you use those. The it depends on what you're using them for. If you're using, for example, for pull requests, uh, we have some GitHub Actions, sample GitHub Actions that will do stuff like create a branch whenever you create a PR, and I think there's probably some rules there, I don't remember to also delete them uh, or after some timeout. Uh, there's also a feature in the, the admin console to kind of refresh a branch, which means basically just drop the branch and create a new one from the top of the, uh, the main branch, uh, but keep the connection string unchanged so you don't need to change your application, kind of just reset it. Um, but yeah, it depends on what you're doing. Some of our users, it's a small subset, but they're actually finding a lot of value in branching, are actually using the branches as part of the application. Like one, one customer we have is doing some kind of a supply chain uh, simulations uh, using Neon, and the way it works is that you load data into the database, you run your simulation on it, then you tune some parameters, uh, you know, UI, and you run the simulation again, and then you tune them again and run it again. And every time they do that, they create a branch, and then they can decide to, to go back to that or drop it. And then in that case, they have actually, they're actually using those APIs as part of their application, uh, and the application is managing it. Okay, I have a question. How, how it works with uh, huge databases? I mean, what was the biggest database you have? Biggest one today, I think, is around somewhere between one and five terabytes. I think is the biggest one. What is in um, in memory? You mean, or just uh, storage? A storage. Okay. Um, How about memory? I have like databases, maybe 64 gigabit gigabytes in RAM. Would it be s scalable in that case? Uh, if we're no. branching all these nice features here. Sure. So every. Like you can have how much memory you want. It's the same as Postgres. Okay. How much memory do you want to have for a server? Or in this case, how, you know, what do you want to set the max size that we scale up to? I don't remember what is the maximum we support at the moment, but that's basically just uh, you know, how big instances can you get from cloud provider. Okay. So w can I run it as well on premises or? Uh, the bits are open source, so you can download it from GitHub and do that. We don't. Do okay. that, like we don't support, we don't put any effort into helping people do that because we are like our business is to of course, the cloud yeah. service. So whatever we do, we do it to help our service. Uh, but we do, we are like we are proud of being open source, and so the bits are oh, definitely cool. there if you want to do that. But it okay. will take some setup. I, I wouldn't necessarily recommend Thanks. to be honest. Come in, come in. <laughs> Okay, um, I was going to ask a similar question, like I was a bit surprised you hadn't mentioned the open source bit yet, given this conference. Um, but I was wondering, like, you, you don't, like, officially support this or promote it, but still you kind of promote it in the community on the Discord, like, it's there, give it a try. Um, is your intention any way to make sure that all the enhancements that you do in the future go into the open source engine? I understand right. you need a business advantage, so you want to use your control plane and everything, but yeah. all the features that are important for running this service as a storage engine, are you definitely intending to keep them open source? Yeah, that is the plan, for sure. Like, we don't have a special fork for our own purposes. Like, what we install is on the open source repo, that's where it comes from. Uh, 
we do have a, like the, co the control plane console parts are not open source, that's true. Uh, like, you know, all of the web user interface, but the bits, like the storage system is totally open source and we intend to keep it that way. Uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, a couple questions just with thinking. Basically, with your architecture, is it right that on the Postgres on the front end side, you saving something on memory because you don't need a file cache at all, right? Uh, what's the question again? So, um, with a Postgres, with, which is kind of front end for you, mm -hmm. and with backing storage, you're basically saving on memory because you don't need a file cache, like page oh. cache uh, system side. So, on that, so, Postgres actually relies heavily on the operating system cache and the file cache. So, in the beginning, like we didn't have that, like we didn't get the benefits of the file cache, and that kind of sucks on Postgres. You really need the file cache, you need the operating system cache. So what we have done is that we actually have a second level of cache uh, between shared buffers and, and the storage system, which is uh, local files on disk, and, then, uh, and we use that. Uh, the other option would be if we would be able to resize shared buffers, but Postgres doesn't let us do that today, so that's why we kind of have that second level cache. So the, the, the operating system cache is actually pretty important for, for performance, and that's why we, we, have, we do that, actually. Mm -hmm. And uh, just one more question, sorry. Uh, because you, when you're streaming files to the storage, uh, you're reorganizing them in LSM tree, something like mm -hmm. that, per page, as I understand. Like. And do you have some optimizations? Like because there are some changes which users don't see, like when you mark and delete it, and then uh, after Wacom will clean it up, or is it like the raw? Um, there's nothing special there. It's like we try to keep, our, you know, keep true to whatever Postgres is doing in those cases. So it really the storage system, as far as as much as possible, it only deals with eight kilobyte pages and we use the Postgres replay routines to do the replay and stuff. So like we try, we try not to be too smart there to make sure it's, it's stable and works. Um, I think that's the best answer. The one thing that people do ask, actually ask about time travel is like could you do this also on the fly? Like instead of having a whole separate Postgres instance running at a different point in time, you could imagine that you could just request all pages from a recent Postgres version as well uh, that's another thing that we don't do because it gets complicated with dependencies and there's some stuff like the uh, uh, xlog uh, or other SLRUs we have that are kind of, you, you, can't just, you can't just take an old page version and interpret it using the new, uh, you know, other new parts of the rest of the system. We, we, don't, we try not to do that. But we do have the advantage that it's very fast to just spin up a new Postgres uh, instance. Oh, okay. Yeah, left first. I'm wondering, uh, is it easily possible to do a major version upgrade in place, uh, like PG upgrade, or what would be the story here? Uh, that's a good question. We don't, we haven't implemented that. Uh, we do have plans to implement that. Uh, that's like on the roadmap. Uh, I think it will be. I think we will make. I think. This is going to be awesome on Neon. That's, that's my gut feeling because what you can do, like that, and that's how we we're imagining it to work, is that you just click a button and it will run PT upgrade for you. But because of all the branching and this nice stuff, it, it can run that behind the scenes and it will just create you a new branch. Uh, and because it's a cloud service, like we can actually, you know, we can manage how do you keep the old and the new version and stuff. So I, I think that's going to be awesome, but it doesn't exist today. <laughs> like that's, that's, that's the gist of it. I'm actually a bit surprised that few, few of our customers have asked for that. Like I, we have been kind of delaying doing that for about a year now because we just haven't heard many people asking for it. I think we will start to hear about it more you know, as time goes on, but uh, at the moment uh, our customers mostly seem to be happy just running whatever old versions they were on when they started. I guess that you know, even version 14, 15 were pretty good versions. I, I think that's the reason. There has been very little reason for people to upgrade so far. Hello. Hey. Uh, what's the increase in storage size for, the, for this Neon storage compared to the traditional setup of a Postgres? Uh, it depends. 
like let's say I keep a, I try to maintain a backup of six months. So, yeah. Right. So yeah. there's two parts to this. Yeah. It shouldn't be much more than you would have with regular Postgres and backups and while archive. Like if you think about it, it's the same amount of data we're keeping really. Uh, but we do have implementation problems there. Like our, currently our storage, the, the amount of storage that we keep is like two or three times more than, than you would see on Postgres and what we are actually charging our customers for because that's kind of our fault. Uh, there's, there's, uh, uh, like storage amplification issues with this uh, system that we haven't yet figured out. We've been kind of delaying addressing that because it's just something that we can, we can pay our way out of for now. But we do have plans, like we do have plans to implement, improve the way we do the compaction and all of that. Like that's all kind of basic stuff. If you look at the LSM tree or you know, literature, there's ways to do that and we know how to do it, but we just haven't done it yet. So if you do install this on your own and uh, you, you might see that, that it's actually taking a lot more space, but it, you know, we plan to fix that. Yeah, uh, just a follow up on that. Yeah. Because you use the pricing uh, model based on the size, et cetera, right? So how, how do you do the charging based on the traditional size of the DB or just how, how much size the neon uh, storage takes? We are, so we are working on that. We, the current model we have is, is basically based on the logical, like the size of your database. And, you know, if you go to and connect to it and do like list databases, add up the sizes, that size. Okay. Uh, and then the amount of wow uh, that we are kind of keeping. And, and okay. It's kind of the same amount that you would uh, have on other providers, the same amount from other storage. The fact I mentioned that we have like implementations with bloat, uh, you, you, like cu our customers are not paying for that. Like we are charging them for the kind of minimum amount of storage that you would see on a regular Postgres installation, keeping the minimum amount of backups and the, the amount of while that you are seeing. But we're actually working on, on this because it gets complicated with these branches and, uh, and uh, yeah, our customers are like, don't understand the model very well and we, we don't understand the model very well always either, to be honest. <laughs> so we, have, we are kind of trying to figure this out. But it's, based, it's basically based on giga, you know, the price per gigabyte hour that you're using it. That's what it boils down to. Thank you. I have a comment and a question. Because uh, I know from the open source version, you can enable image compression, which will principally um, compress your data, which yeah. Postgres can't even do. So it might even be more efficient in certain use cases, I guess. Um, but the question is like you have a set of patches on top of regular Postgres, mm -hmm. it's not a very large set. Do you see this no longer being necessary in some future? Is there any progress getting this merged into the, uh, the main tree? There's no progress. Uh, we've been a bit lazy on that. Uh, we should put more effort into getting rid of those patches. Um, but I don't think there's anything fundamentally wrong or hard that, you know, still we just haven't made progress on it. What was the first part of the question? Oh, right, so yes. Yeah, we do compress data, we do compress, uh, but yeah, we do compress data and that, that is nice. But it's still, uh, like the other inefficiencies we have are kind of larger. Hi, can we branch back into any time or does this depend upon your uh, retention time policy? So yeah, there's a retention time policy. You can set it on the, on the user interface. Um, let's see if I still have, no, I closed the browser. But like, yeah, it's like there's a user configurable policy of you want to, how long do you want to keep, uh, keep the logs and that's how long we keep it. Or you can create additional branches like as snapshots if you want to have some additional points in time that you want to keep, uh, that, that's how you do that. Hi, uh, can, you have a, can, can you have Postgres running traditionally and then streaming replication or uh, copying WAL files to restore on Neon? Right, we haven't done that, like we don't do that as a, as a cloud provider, but yes, you, you, it wouldn't be hard to build. Uh, that would be very straightforward. Like the WAL format is compatible that we could process the WAL coming from unchanged Postgres. Uh, actually, that's something we haven't done, but I've been thinking that it would be very cool to do, to do this and just use our storage system as a backup solution for a regular vanilla, you know, Postgres running somewhere else and just do the streaming. And then you could, you could then like use the time travel uh, uh, you could use Neon just for the time travel part, but keep your main uh, data running somewhere else. So, yeah. right. 
Yeah, that, that's something we've been thinking of, but haven't implemented yet. But it would be straightforward. Like the main difficulty would be figuring out the user interface and stuff like that. Yeah, that you could do. Yeah, so my question was a bit the same uh, inverse. It, uh, do you allow to uh, connect and do a PG-based backup, which it should uh, be trivial because you can just get all the page and. So then, similar uh, story there. We don't. We don't, like, we don't have the APIs for that currently, but we do actually have that internally, like the storage system has that API. Uh, we just haven't exposed it. Uh, but yeah, uh, we would be fine doing that. Like if you have a use case for that, we could do that. Like we don't intend to keep the, your data hostage <laughs> like that. That's not how we want to do this. Um, yeah, this. But the storage system can already create a Postgres compatible base backup uh, of, the, of your system out of the storage system. Actually, like at any point in time, so you can, you can <laughs> take a back, you know, extra export the backup from any point in time uh, using that. Uh, speaking of short buffers, uh, like typically it's recommended maybe 25% of available memory. Uh, what's in in Neon's case? What's the shared buffers? You said. Yeah. So what we currently do, because it's, it's a serverless thing, so we want to be able to resize your VM. Is what we currently do. We actually always set shared buffers to 128 megabytes, which is not a lot. Mm. Uh, but we do, but then we do have this additional, what we call local file cache, kind of second layer of caching uh, behind that. Uh, it's not as fast as shared buffers, like we are losing 10 to 20% depending on your workload of performance because of that. Uh, but it's like that allows us to resize it and it gives us other flexibility. So that's why we're, we're doing it that way currently. If Postgres would have like, shared buffers that you can resize on the fly, uh, we would, would be cool. switch to that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so the second question, how about the extensions? Can I use any extension? Particularly, I'm interested in time scale DB. Yeah, I think we have a time. I think we've tested that. Uh, most extensions just work. If it's something storage related or something that needs to store local files on disk, that's a bit of a problem because mm. kind of our disk goes away. Um, but anything else, like any data types, post GIS, just you know, all the common ones, PG vector, uh, most extensions just work. Uh, anything that doesn't try to do any, you know, anything too clever or like anything very invasive to the storage layer will just work. And if one more question, if a new version of Postgres is released, how long time you need to? <laughs> uh, Postgres 17 we released like at the same time as the community release. Oh, um, okay. like. We were watching the website when it's the announcement and <laughs> flipped the feature flag and you know popped a bottle of champagne. <laughs> uh, that was kind of uh, what we did with 17. 16 took us a little longer, but we plan to like we plan to actually like keep up with the Postgres releases. Okay, a quick follow up to the last one about the extension. I mean, what about PG start statements? Doesn't that have something on file for that stuff? Or does yeah, that you yeah, that's something we're working on. Yeah, you lose that. Um, okay, yeah, so, that, yeah, it gets reset sad, every but time. But hopefully uh, yeah. you get it work. Oh, and I had, I had a quick other question, if possible. I think yes, it, uh, it's too late. Okay, yep. uh, yesterday I think you mentioned that you're you're spinning up VMs uh, for every fork or something, and it only takes a second. Can you say something about how you managed to do that? Is that uh, magic or proprietary <laughs> or just cool? It's that's yeah. Those parts are not totally open source. Some of them are actually. Uh, but yeah, I can talk about that. Like the, we do keep a pool of. Uh, pre-warmed VMs, that's basically how. And we have like all of the software there. And it's just that when you connect, we tell it, okay, you are now this tenant, and then it connects to the storage system uh, and just a little initialization. So that's, how, that's basically how we keep a pool of VMs. Thank you, it looks like we're out of time. We're out of time. Uh, thanks for all the great questions and thanks for coming. <laughs> <laughs>